Hello, everyone. I'm Mariela Rosario. I'm the editor in chief of Hip Latina, the largest site for Latina millennials here in the US. Thank you for joining us for this B conference panel entitled Diversity and Inclusion Breaking Barriers. I'll be speaking with women who are creating programs and using their platforms to drive conversations about racial justice, diversity, and inclusion in Hollywood and beyond. The world has changed not once but twice recently as we've, as we've collectively grappled with the devastating effects of COVID-19 and inspiring changes and in actions around the Black Lives Matter movement. I'm proud to be here to talk about this very important topic in these pivotal times with a great group of women. Our incredible panelists today include Arisha Hatch from Color of Change, actress Haley Sahar from Pose, and Yvette Rodriguez of AEM and La Collab. Unfortunately, Olga Segura, who is a co-founder of Latinx House, is unable to join us today due to a family emergency. But we'll talk a little bit about her efforts and what she's been doing to move the conversation forward a little bit later. So just some housekeeping notes before we introduce our panelists. I'll be speaking with them for about 40 minutes and afterwards we'll be taking audience questions for about 20. We encourage you to participate. Just add your questions in the comment section to the right of the screen and the RAP team will post the questions as we go for the panelists to the answers. Throughout the event, we will also be using the hashtag Econ2020, and you can also tag us on Instagram at RAPWomen and Twitter at the Rap Women, so we can repost and amplify your posts. Also, be sure to visit the website, rapwomen.com, and you can stay up to date on all things and events that they're handling and sign up for their weekly newsletter. So first, we will start with Arisha. <laughs> I'd love for you to just tell us a little bit about who you are and the work that you've been doing. Sure, my name is Arisha Hatch. I'm the Vice President and Chief of Campaigns at Color of Change, which is one of the largest racial justice countries, uh, racial justice organization and organizations in the country. We are really focused on improving the world uh, improving the world and improving the lives of Black people. Um, we were founded in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, um, where our founders um, tuned into television and saw Black people stranded on their rooftops. They saw media calling us looters and rioters for trying to get basic supplies, and they saw the government patting themselves um, on the back for a job well done. Um, and uh, they saw that as an absence of Black political power and um, in that moment decided to form a 21st century civil rights organization that was focused on forcing decision makers, um, whether they were uh, government officials or corporate, corporate decision makers, to actually be accountable to Black people, to go to sleep each night afraid of disappointing Black people. <laughs> yes. Haley, star of one of my favorite shows. <laughs> Can you go next? Hi, um, I'm Haley Sahar. I star on Ryan Murphy's FX Pose, which has the largest amount of transgender actors in leading roles in history. I'm also on Free Forms Good Trouble. And um, my activism comes in with my visibility. I'm a former Queen USA and Miss LA Pride. And I also help at the Women's East LA Center for uh, Domestic Violence. Wonderful. And Yvette, La Hi. 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 Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Yvette Rodriguez. Um, I am the president of AEM, a Hispanic marketing and PR firm that I founded 23 years ago. And um, today I'm here with my LACO Lab Hat, an initiative that I co-founded with LA Mayor Eric Garcetti and Beatriz Acevedo. Um, to accelerate access and representations for Latinos in entertainment. And this came to be after um, after just the data that kept coming out as our numbers are growing, our representation is dwindling. And um, a, a group of us um, out of Sundance a year ago were complaining on social media, like, what are we gonna do? How is this possible? We go to the movies, we do this. How is it that we are being erased from culture? And um, based on that, um, we founded La Collab. Wonderful. So we're going to keep on talking a little bit more about your personal story since you're all activists in the business of storytelling. I want to know your stories. What was the moment that you knew the fight for diversity and inclusion would really define your career, your efforts? Whoever wants to start. <laughs> I can start. Yeah. I think for me, the significance in being 
um, an open woman of trans experience. I don't think I've ever known a sense of uh, quote unquote, you know, normalcy or privilege. I think when I was born into this world, my my just existence became activism. Uh, no matter what I do, everything I do will be an, an activism move. So I think I knew, well, actually I know I knew early on that um, my journey was not gonna be the norm and I was gonna have to fight every step of the way to be respected, to be in spaces and to be heard. So I knew since childhood that my journey was going to be aligned with activism. That's a beautiful answer. Uh, Arisha, can you go next? Sure. Um, well, a little bit about me. I am um, the daughter of Patricia Hatch, who was a retired elementary school teacher and the daughter of Ollie, who was a salesman. Um, I didn't grow up with politics or civil rights or anything like that around the dinner table. I actually grew up always knowing that I was supposed to be a lawyer, um, <laughs> perhaps because my grandmother wasn't allowed to, um, perhaps because my father couldn't afford to be, maybe because I was like one of those argumentative girls. And that's what they sort of tell argumentative girls uh, to do to go to law school. And so um, I always thought this was what I was supposed to be. I you know, went, you know, went to undergrad and went straight to law school. Um, I remember growing up watching Allie McBeal and I thought being a lawyer would be like being on Allie McBeal. And of course it was nothing like that. Um, and um, ended up going uh, more into an organizing direction. But if, if I actually think about um, uh, maybe the moment that I knew that diversity and inclusion would be an important theme in my life, it was back similar to Haley as a child. Um, I remember being in fourth grade and at fourth grade, we used to play these like class team sports during lunch. And so one month it would be a volleyball tournament. The next month it would be dodgeball. And then um, finally softball came up. I was really into sports, but I was really good at basketball and soccer. I didn't like any other sports. Um, and, but we got to the softball sort of like section uh, of the year. And we had these two uh, young boys who were our class team captains who got to pick the batting order. And I remember saying to them, like, I suck at softball, put me at the end. And um, when the batting order came up, what I actually saw was that there were like uh, five boys in front of me, then it was me, and then it was all boys, and then all the girls were sort of at the end of the line. And I remember being like immediately on a gut level, like really upset by the fact that all the girls except for me were at the front of the line. And I like went to the team captains, both of whom I had a crush on at the time. And I said, why am I up here? And like all of these other girls are back there. And they said to me, well, we knew Arisha, if we didn't put you up here that you would complain. Um, and so that's why you're here. And I remember being so upset in the moment, like I was being divided from my other girlfriends. And so I went up and like struck out because I was awful and went to the back of the batting order and started to tell the other girls like, hey, did you know they put us back here because we're girls? Um, and what's so funny about that moment, like we started a little petition and all the girls signed. And eventually we got to the point where the team captains had to do like, you know, boy, girl, girl, boy, or whatever um, in terms of the batting lineup. Um, but, um, I think I understood then that this would always, um, be a fight that I really cared about. It was something I cared about on a gut level, um, back then. And I think I've sort of carried those values, um, moving forward. You're a natural born advocate. <laughs> <laughs> Yvette, let's hear your story. My story. So, um, I'm actually, I'm an immigrant and I grew up in a small town in New Jersey, um, with really where the majority of people were working class and from all walks of life, what you would call a melting pot. So we had a, we had a, a lot of common commonalities in our, in our situations. And we were, you know, Irish American, Latinos, African American, everybody worked at Johnson and Johnson or at, or at Ford Motor and they had livable wages. We, most people owned homes. We went to an incredible public school. I didn't really understand that I was different frankly, until I got into the workforce. Because for me, I'm a Jersey girl, American girl, um, and I'm the daughter of an immigrant, so a hard worker. And it wasn't until I got into the workforce, um, starting in New York, in a building where I was really the only brown person in the entire building, and being asked questions that I supposedly should have some kind of insight on because of the color of my skin, which it wasn't until after 
being called into meetings and being asked specific questions over and over that I realized like, oh, you, I'm different. Like you think I'm different. You, you don't think I'm just another American girl. And so that was New York cut to La La Land, Hollywood. And that's where the rude awakening happened. Um, and that is um, just being in a room where folks would say things and it's just shocking because somehow maybe I appeared, I don't know, I was a comfortable person. I spoke English. I don't know. They had these preconceived notions of who I was. They were comfortable. Things were being said that I just could not believe were being said in front of me. And that sort of started to like pick away at me and pick away at me. And I recall, um, you know, two moments, one really big moment where I worked on a specific film about a specific group of Latinos that come from a specific group in New York. I'm from New Jersey and where I had a studio executive tell me, I now understand you. And I thought, oh, how, why, how do you understand me? And it's like, oh, I saw this film and now I understand what being Puerto Rican is. And I was like, oh, okay, I didn't grow up in the Bronx and I didn't grow up in that experience. I actually have a different experience. But anyway, that was shocking to me. And also um, just little things like that would nudge at me. So actually at the same time, it, it propelled me into starting my own company which I started um, 23 years ago. And the name of the company is American Entertainment Marketing. So for 23 years, I've been trying to get this point across. Like we are American. And um, so when did I become an activist? I mean, I think I've always been an activist and I'm, I hope I answered the question. I get a little hot and bothered about this. <laughs> no, you definitely did. There's a beautiful through line, you know, of the fact that as a woman of color um, or somebody who identifies as LGBTQIA, like, you're forced to make a choice <laughs> about whether or not you're gonna stand in your power, right? Um, so there's been a definite before and after the pandemic and recent Black Lives Matter uh, protests. Lots of declarations have been made by both media companies and corporations about the importance of diversity and inclusion. So I wanna know from you guys as experts, who do you really feel has been putting their money where their mouth is? I think that the newer generations, the millennials, I think that we are uh, definitely stepping up more, speaking out more, and not tolerating ignorance, not tolerating diversity, and um, I'm sorry, not diversity, not tolerating ignorance, not tolerating um, anything that separates us to say, I'm better than you, I'm different than you. We are stepping up. A lot of us have had experiences with people that are of different races and uh, sexual orientation or gender identity. So a lot of us um, are simply here just to enjoy life and experience each other and love each other. And I think that newer generations are stepping up and speaking out more often. I hope I answered that correctly. I got a little mumble there, but yeah. <laughs> it's all good. Yvette? <laughs> Myself apologies. Um, so I absolutely agree with you, Haley. Um, I think that the gener Generation Z and young millennials are the future. And um, and so I'm very um, excited about that generation, um, specifically who's doing a great job. Um, luckily, we are having conversations with some studios that are looking at change. I mean, just recently, um, CBS um, announced that their 25% of their development budget would be going to people of color and um, creators um, and also NBC News, um, which is run by a Latino, which is incredible. Um, they announced, they also announced like 50% of their workforce would be, um, you know, made up of people with color. So I think those, um, those two that just off the top of my head are, are great examples. I mean, we have certainly a long way to go. Arisha? <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, it's, it's so hard to uh, uh, celebrate folks because I, I, I know for folks that do organizing work, especially around diversity and inclusion, we know that there's so much work to do. And yet we're in this like transformational moment um, in this country and globally, really, um, in which corporations especially have spoken out much louder um, in much bigger ways than they have in the past about their commitment to valuing Black lives. Um, and um, we have seen, seen some folks, um, you know, make real changes um, in terms of, uh, you know, we were working with CBS on um, 
um, making sure that um, undocumented folks could be a part of their programming um, or could be hired. Um, there are a number of like tech companies that we've been working with, with that have really been thinking about hate speech um, on their platforms and the impacts on black people and other people of color. Um, and yet there's so much more work to do to make sure that we're moving beyond just sort of a performative thing that's happening sort of in the moment during the uprisings. Um, and so part of our work the last month or so at Color of Change is asking um, corporations to move beyond the statement um, and to really think about um, even beyond diversity, uh, the types of changes that they can make that could have actually positive impacts on black people. Um, and so we're involved in a lot of um, conversations. It's so unfortunate to me that we're in this pandemic and this lockdown and we might not have like new media, um, um, new television shows for a while because I do think that there are a lot of people who are looking at content and trying to um, wanna make sure that their, their next show um, is actually like representative um, of our communities. Um, I'm going to actually switch around in the order of the questions because I feel like there's a follow up here for what Arisha was saying. What do you guys see as the biggest challenge you face in your fight for more inclusion of POC, LGBTQI stories or representation or even just jobs across um, the media industry? Yeah, there, I mean, there's so many challenges and I think it's really important that um, people understand that at this point, like diversity um, behind the scenes, um, uh, diversity in, in terms of programming is like the bare minimum. Like that's just like yeah. the baseline um, that we're looking for. And we're actually looking for folks to get a little bit beyond that. Like we need to, you need to like solve this diversity problem because we know we don't have a pipeline problem. We know that we have um, a problem at the top of the pipe with, uh, uh, you know, we have a cap at the top of the pipe that pipe that isn't allowing water to come in. Um, and so like those things need to be resolved. But beyond that, um, what's uh, sh deeply problematic are the representations that are being shown, the representations that allow um, or enable this sort of like hostile culture or environment towards all sorts of marginalized communities. At Color of Change, we did um, a research project with USC um, and produced a report specifically on crime procedurals. These are the shows like Law and Order, SB, Law and Order, SBU, all those sorts of things um, that really, that people love, they're super popular, but have the effect um, in many cases of normalizing injustice. They normalize excessive force. Um, you know, we have these cops that are doing these unconstitutional things and yet they're made, made to be huge heroes in these scripts. Um, and so we've been really working closely with uh, writers rooms that work on those sorts of projects to make sure that the, not only that they're diverse behind the scenes in the writers rooms and diverse on the camera, but they're uh, actually considering the impacts uh, of the messaging that they're spreading, the impacts of the moral arcs that are being discussed, um, and that we're actually like reflecting on television an accurate portrayal of the criminal justice system, which we don't believe is happening right now, and which has incredibly negative impacts on black people. Yeah, we're definitely gonna circle back to that study, but I wanna hear from Haley and Yvette about um, the biggest challenges they've faced as they fight for inclusion and more visibility. Well, I think, well, for me, I can say there's so many intersections that I'm met with. One, I'm, in, I'm a multiracial person. I also am black. And so that is one intersection of people not knowing what I am or knowing how to perceive me. That's one intersection. On top of that, I also am a woman. And so that comes another intersection. On top of that, I'm a one of trans experience. So my walk of life has never been cookie cutter or been easy. So I think that the most challenging thing for me is silencing all of these labels and just looking at me as a human being, as a woman who just has dreams and who just wants to enjoy life while I'm here. Uh, my grandfather, um, before he passed away, was a pastor of, of, of our church. And one of the things he used to always say was, you know, when something is profound, um, continue to say that over and over and it's no need to change it. And every year he would have his anniversary and it always said, on his banner, um, job well done, my good and faithful servant. And someone said, you know, I've been coming here for about 20 years. Why do you keep saying that? He said, because when something makes sense, why change it? And I say that to say, there's a simplicity that we miss as human beings. When we silence all of the labels and silence all of the, you're different because you were born here and you're different because you were born this way. When we silence all of that, the basic 
thing that we're left with is that we're human beings. So we need to come back to the simplicity of how to just treat people and accept people. And I think that that's the hurdle that we need to get over when it comes to the prejudices that live in the world and the things that make it challenging for us to move forward as a nation, um, as a human race. And so I hope I answered that question. Yeah, that was an incredible answer. <laughs> um, Yvette. Um, the question is, <laughs> what's the biggest challenge that you <laughs> faced um, as you've fought for more inclusion across the media industry? Well, I think that um, there's a lot, there's been a lot of talk about diversity and inclusion in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. There are divisions that are responsible for this, um, folks. And at the end of the day, um, nothing has happened, really. The, we, we continue to talk about it. So what's the challenge? The challenge is, is that until we actually have a seat at every single table, um, we're never, it, we're never going to move forward because anyone that has any kind of power in Hollywood, whether it's hiring power, whatever division you're in, whether it's green lighting power, it's power. And it doesn't matter who you are, it's power. And you say, I want to make change, but as long as you don't take my power away, as long as it doesn't change my pocketbook, as long as I don't have to change, then I'm all for this. And it, that's, that's one of the challenges that I find. Um, and also at the end of the day, the biggest challenge is until the executive leadership of this industry and, and the board seats are filled with what America looks like, we will, we will not see the change that we need. That was a fabulous answer too. It reminds me of the quote that, um, that has gone around Instagram a lot lately about people in power. To people in power, equality feels like oppression. <laughs> Um, and I feel like that's a, a very reflective in your answer, Yvette. Um, Arisha and Haley, I kind of want to start with you on this next question because it's a combination of talking about humanizing our experiences, but also this report that Color of Change released in January on Crime TV was incredible. And it's really just startling how popular this genre is. It's the most popular genre on television and how... Um, incredibly, it just normalizes racism and justice, the absolute stripping of human rights of people. Um, so what's the role that we can take as advocates for diversity and inclusion in ensuring that our stories are told both accurately and that we're humanizing ourselves? Because I do feel like what Haley said is 100% on point. Whoever wants to start. <laughs> Um, I'll go. Uh, um, so, I mean, I think it, you know, we're, we're doing a number of different things. Like one, we're moving um, directly into writer's rooms to have like conversations. We're trying to bring impacted folks into writer's rooms so that folks get a more nuanced um, view. And what we're looking for, we're not looking for like just a bunch of black characters who are angels. What we're actually looking for is like more nuance, more complication, more backstory about their families, more backstory about the challenges um, that they're facing in their lives. Um, what our report showed, which looked at um, uh, a bunch of crime procedurals um, uh, currently is that one, there's a lack of diversity behind the scenes. Um, but beyond that, um, there are several shows that uh, in the crime drama, drama realm that do do really great things. There's stuff on Netflix like Seven Seconds or Orange is the New Black. Um, and we've seen, we have examples of when there is diversity and representation behind the scenes, when there is a commitment to actually uh, showing a system in an accurate way, um, that we can actually end up with amazing portrayals, complicated portrayals of Black people. And I think that's what's um, really humanizing. The broader fight, I think, for um, diversity and inclusion is really about um, pushing for a more humane world and pushing for the benefit of the doubt in the situations. Like so mm -hmm. um, very few times are like black people, trans people, other people of color, um, given the benefit of the doubt in a number of different situations. And that is because um, uh, we are seeing a lot of flat characters. That is because there are so many deeply ingrained biases. Um, um, and you know, for some people, the media that they see on television is the only time that they will encounter a black person or a trans person or any sort of person outside of their, their comfort zone or outside of their direct community. 
So it's just incredibly important that media companies understand that there are that this is not just entertainment for people, um, that there are actually real world consequences to the things that we see. Yeah. Yes, and I agree, I agree to that. There is not enough diversity behind the scenes. And I definitely um, am an advocate for holding people in positions of power accountable. Um, we're no longer going to accept this uh, diversion that we have of these these different levels of, of hierarchy. And so I think it's important for us to hold those in positions of power accountable. And also going back to the simplicity that I was talking about earlier, checking in with ourselves. You know, I say this in all of my interviews, um, you know, time on this planet is so short and we waste so much time with the back and forth. There is something that was taught to most of us as children, which is to respect other people. At what point in our lives of adulthood do we forget that lesson when you were taught as a friend? I mean, as a child, don't hit that person. Don't be mean to that person. At what point do you age and become you, you lose that information. I think we need to get back to the simplicity as I was speaking before of remembering we are human beings, all of us. No one's gonna be here forever. So you're wasting so much time being uh, these divisions that we set up and these these levels of privilege that we give ourselves, we're wasting so much time when time itself is short. And so I think that we need to get back to humanizing each other and remember that we're on this planet with each other for a short amount of time and we need to enjoy this time and space while we're here and holding people in positions of power accountable um, to make that change. Yvette, do you wanna add? I would, I agree with, yeah. with both of you, so I'm not gonna repeat that. I, what I would um, say is that um, our industry, I'm talking to Hollywood and the media, um, you build public perception. You have the unique ability to heal this country and this world. You just do. It's by when you turn on the television, how people see themselves, how they see um, how they see others. It's like you, this literally, this industry has the power to do this. And that's what we need more than anything. So our common humanity, you know, so that we can all hold hands and know that we have this universal experience. We love, we hurt. We need the diversity of our experiences and we need to stop these stereotypes. They're dangerous. When um, next Monday, August 3rd, I hate to bring this up, but it is the one year anniversary of the El Paso massacre, where a white deranged supremacist um, drove 650 miles to stop the Hispanic invasion and to kill Mexicans. Where did he get these ideas? Like where, what, it's media, it's what he's reading. It's when you go to school, you don't know the history of, um, of all of our communities and what we've uh, contributed to this country because we have been erased from history books. Another thing is next Monday, the house um, will um, vote on the American Latino Museum. Um, and so excited, please pray for this. This will happen on Monday. And uh, just a note, the African American Museum is the most visited museum in the world in the world and it took decades and decades of hard work. So when people can see each other and, and see our common humanity, um, we will we will heal, but it's gonna take time for us to fix all of the problems. But Hollywood, you have this incredible power and I hope that you use it. I love that, it. Yeah, that was <laughs> very impassioned. Eva, I wanna, I wanna go back to you um, right away actually, because I know a lot of the work that you've done with La Collab has really looped in um, you know, big time decision makers like Mayor Garcetti, and you have experience being, as you mentioned before, being in the room with some of these studio execs. So I want to know, in your opinion, how can we keep these gatekeepers accountable for making sure that this culture shift isn't a temporary trend, but rather sustainable and tangible for our communities in the future? Right. Um, well, we just got to keep doing what we're doing. I mean, La Colab was was born on January 13th of this year. I can't like the world has changed since, it was, you know, we had these incredible meetings with the studios and then COVID happened and then the Black Lives Matter movement happened. And so um, and I that's why I'm so excited that color that um, is on here, because I really um, look to them and the work that they've been doing for the last 10 years. And we want to partner with them and and unite and, um, all these organizations so that we can work together to make sure that we keep fighting for this. Um, I don't think I answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> it's OK. 
Um, I think, you know, collaboration is, it's part of Laco Lab's name. <laughs> I think that's super important. Um, but Arisha, let's see, let's hear from you because I know Color of Change has a pretty incredible track record of holding people accountable mm -hmm. <laughs> and getting shit done, quite frankly. So <laughs> I'd love yeah. to hear your opinion on this. Yeah, and, it, and that's the challenges um, inherent in this sort of work. Well, I think what can be done to hold them accountable, like the gatekeepers and making sure that mm -hmm. this is sustainable. Yeah, I mean, I think the way that we think about the work, like, you know, we try to build a bridge and you try to like walk people nicely across that bridge and like, or find people internally that'll help others walk across the bridge. Um, and it's great when that can happen when you identify internal allies and they share your values and they have enough power to make it work. Um, a lot of the times, like, um, someone is just not going to walk across the bridge with you. Like, they just have too many incentives to walk uh, across the bridge with you. And they, like, don't need to be on the bridge. They need to be called out. They need to be replaced with someone. Um, um, uh, and, and, you know, a change needs to sort of happen. And that, and, and, and it's, it's, it's horrible when it has to get to that point. Like, we would like to believe in everyone's best selves. But, like, some people just um can't walk across the bridge with us and i think at some point we have to acknowledge that and so you know uh at color of change we've worked to like remove folks like glenn beck or bill o'reilly like those people are not going to walk across the bridge with us um they're not going to improve the way that they show and there are a lot of people um that we're still working on that we know aren't going to walk across the bridge and we'll have to get to a point um where we do call them out one of my and sort of like to the challenge question i think one of the um I, I see two challenges in this work. One is that um, people tend to make changes in response to crisis and only in a PR way. Um, they're not doing it from this like genuine gut, like I wanna do it, like something happens in the world and they wanna like not be on the wrong side of public history. And I think that's really hard to sustain because um, moments like what happened last month, hopefully will not continue to happen. Um, um, or, well, hopefully they continue to happen, but many of those things happen really behind the scenes. We never hear about them. And then the other thing is just, there's just a lot of excuses. Um, there's a lot of excuses um, about um, whether marginalized communities, marginalized creatives are creative enough, talented enough, whether there's enough of us, which is just um, ridiculous to me. Like creativity comes from being an outsider. <laughs> like that's where it comes from. And, um, you know, there's just a ton of excuses uh, that I think are deeply racist and sexist. There's excuses about who will come to watch a movie when we've seen all of these examples of like, when you put black people in movies, when you put trans people in shows, when you put women in front of the camera, like it's a money maker. We've seen it so many different times. And so it's getting beyond those sort of status quo excuses that I think is our, our, our work. Kelly, do you have anything to add? Yes, can you just repeat the question one more time for me? <laughs> it was just how how do you feel like we can keep the gatekeepers accountable, you know, like the people who are in charge of making decisions on how we look and and the shows that are approved um, in a sustainable manner so that it's not just like a blip on the radar. I think yeah. you're in such a fortunate position to be on this groundbreaking show. So I'd love to yeah, hear well that answer for me, once again, I live by a form of simplicity is simple. Holding people accountable and saying enough is enough. And no, we will not accept this. And especially if you are uh, in positions of having a platform like uh, in, in the industry, I think uh, using your platform to speak out saying absolutely not enough is enough. No, we will not accept this anymore. So holding people in positions of power accountable and also checking yourself checking your own privilege, checking your privilege and being real with yourself and just asking yourself, where do you want our future to go? Because when you're well and gone from this planet, you're setting a tone for the next generation to come. So where actually do you want your children and grandchildren to end up at? Do you want them to be in a world of love and equality or more of what you grew up knowing? So holding people accountable and checking yourself, even me checking myself and saying, absolutely not. I will not accept that. I love that. Um, okay, so this is our last question before we're going to move into some questions from the audience. Um, and I wanna know from each of you, what's the most critical takeaway or call to action that you would like to leave with the folks who are in the room with us right now? <laughs> I, I hope this is the, the answer. Um, 
like I said, I'm gonna, you're going to get tired of me saying this. Everything mm -hmm. I say is very simple because I feel like human beings are actually simple and we make ourselves more complicated. The thing that I would want people to take away is a four letter word, which is love. Um, loving each other, loving yourself and leading with love, living by love. Uh, love does not judge, love is kind, love is pure, love does not harm. So in under all these umbrellas, love needs to exist because if, if that basic word exists, all of this other stuff kind of disappears in a, in a way. So leading with love, living by love, that's what I would want people to take away from this. Okay. Eva or Arisha? <laughs> I, I love it, Haley. I mean, I, I couldn't agree with you more, um, love. But okay, the takeaway um, that we're in this together, you know, we all have to live together and, um, and our common humanity must prevail. It just must. And we all have moms and or we're mothers, we're sisters or brothers, whatever it is. Like, don't, you know, we want it, we want the same things. And so I just hope that we all remember that at the end of the day, we're all the same. And how can people get involved with Laco Lab if they want to find out more about what you're doing and support your costs? Um, lacolab.org, uh, L-A-C-O-L-L-A-B.org, or send an email, hola at lacolab.org. Okay, awesome. Arisha? Um, I My hope is that people um, follow uh, the lead of people that are most impacted. Um, there are a lot of groups, a lot of people that are doing a lot of work on, on a number of these issues, and they have specific demands. Um, and I think as allies, as co-conspirators towards justice, like our job is to show up um, and understand that the leaders of these communities do have um, real answers for what we do. And then finally, it's just um, knowing your power. Like we all have power to like shake things up in our own ways. And sometimes we're looking for other people to exert their power to improve our lives. But um, we have power every single day when we go to work. Um, and it's about assessing uh, that power and figuring out who's around you to sort of move an agenda that is consistent with our values. And how can people get involved with Color of Change? Yeah, you can go to our website, colorofchange.org, and give us your email address. You can also te text the word demands to 55156. That'll get you on our email list and get you updated on all the different campaigns that we're running right now. Is there any effort right now that you're involved in that you guys need support with? Because I know you kind of have I'm on your newsletter list. I get all of the text messages. It's very active. So just wondering if there's a, something that you'd like to push for right now. Um, I mean, there's so many things. Um, you know, we're in the middle of this very important conversation with Facebook. Um, uh, mm -hmm. And um, a part of, and I've called for an advertiser boycott because we're looking for um, more civil rights infrastructure internally. We're looking for them to be a company that cares about the impact of their product on so many marginalized folks. We care about the level of hate speech that is happening. Um, and so we're, um, Facebook is one of the most powerful companies in the history of the world. And um, it really is, uh, it's not just about entertainment. There are life and death consequences to what happens on that platform. Um, there are real consequences for democracy um, with what happens on that platform. And so we're, we're asking people to sort of stand with us um, and demand uh, that they make some changes. Great. And Haley, um, are there any organizations that you'd like to shout out that you'd like us to support in your name? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, East LA uh, Domestic Violence for Women is, is one that I would like to shout out. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, and right now they're just getting some questions ready for me. Can you guys see the screen? Do you want me? I'll read it for you. Alex, yeah. Alex. Alex Vela wants to know, how do you deal with some of the pushback you are probably met with when you try to hold people in the industry accountable? That's a great question. Um, Yvette, I, I'm going with you. <laughs> or Haley, sorry. You no jumped worries. in right before I was about to put no, that on. Go ahead, Haley. Go ahead, Haley. No worries. Go ahead, Haley. Oh, oh yeah. okay. Um, let me read it again really quick. Um, <laughs> I will say that going back to the first question you asked, um, I know that everything that I do comes with activism. So I always know that there's gonna be some pushback. And what I have to do is constantly rejuvenate myself, remind myself what I'm standing for. I'm standing for what I said earlier, which is love and equality. So when I met with that pushback, it is difficult at times, but I'm constantly checking in to say, 
I'm here to, to send a message. I'm here to display love. So let me use this as an opportunity to love that person and to show them how to love and how to be respectful and how to be held accountable. Um, I hope that answers the question. Anyone else want to jump in here? How do you deal with the pushback you're met with when you try to hold people in the industry accountable? I think for me, I would say that I've been, you know, I've been fighting this fight for a really long time. So I've dealt with a lot of pushback. Um, and, um, but I, I, I think that what's transpired in the last year and certainly in the last few months um, is like a renewed energy for me that it's, there's no going back. Um, so just continuing to fight the fight and, and go in and, and, um, and really ask for, for collaboration and allyship from the, from the industry. And I, I find that, Frankly, right this moment, um, I'm having a lot of open conversations with some some folks in power in the different studio systems. So I really do think that they're listening. But again, we cannot let up. So I hope that answered your question. I think we said we all said that a lot today. <laughs> Arisha, do you have any pointers? I, oh wait, I I think just also you know for me it's anticipating the pushback, like the pushback is going to happen. Otherwise we wouldn't yeah. be in the middle of this conversation. Um, being really centered in what you're asking for, being really confident about it. Um, but I think, um, you know, and I think when you're centered and confident and you're anticipating the pushback, you sort of know what people will say and you know how to sort of respond with the right amount of information or research. Um, but also just knowing not everybody's gonna change their minds and um, we have to know who our low hanging fruit are and we have to be able to persist and move on when um, we hit these sorts of roadblocks. That's so tangible. I think um, preparation is key for sure. And then they were popping up another question. Here we go. Carolina Spiro, how do you advise up and coming women of color directors and producers to connect with professionals that are committed to helping them up the ladder? Want to take that one? <laughs> oh, Eva, I think you're on mute. Right. Um, well, I would say that um, you know specifically, I can speak for Laka Lab, and um, and there's been some recent announcements where there's the Latinx director um, um, database, and there's also the um, Latina writers database. And um, we, like a lab, are actually working on two platforms. One is an all-inclusive um, database of Latinos. This is specifically to the Latino community of um, writers, directors, um, actors across the board, every category, academics, um, academia, and then also a match.com. It's not a match.com, but the idea of a match of where we will match um, folks with opportunities. Um, whether it's to mentor other writers or whether it's a program that you have as a studio that you're looking to bring in more people of color. Um, so those are the two things that we're working on right this moment. But uh, it, there's a lot of organizations that, that um, I would say you can get involved in, um, specifically with, you know, um, in the Latino community, you have NALI and you have NHMC and you have Nosotros and, um, and I would reach out to them if um, for opportunities to mentor, et cetera. Does anybody else want to add on to that? Haley, how has your experience been as far as, you know, the work that you're doing as a producer? Um, has it been challenging? Have you found that being on Pose has really opened doors for you? Yes, most definitely. Um, Pose has definitely given me a platform. And mm -hmm. I think with that platform, people have taken me more seriously as opposed mm -hmm. to before. So um, that's why visibility matters. Yeah. Um, and. Um, yeah, holding people accountable. Yeah, okay, great. Danya Sutton, to the panel regarding normalization of such stereotypes you mentioned, specifically violence committed by African-American, Hispanics, et cetera. As a consumer, what can we do other than change the channel? Such a good question. <laughs> Arisha, I think we should start with you here because this is directly what you guys Yeah. Know. I mean, I think on the one hand, it's important to change the channel, but it's also important to like name publicly that you're changing the channel so that people can begin and find other people to change the channel with you. Um, we obviously deal with um, 
at Color of Change, we think of our work as giving people something to do in response to the news stories that they see in the world that is strategic and really try to drive collective action around specific moments, um, which is why a lot of the change that we want happen sort of in these moments of crisis is because the people are more people are aware and committed to fighting it. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I think you have to like name that you're um, uh, turning the channel. And I think at, at some point we have to have like collective action targeting uh, corporate advertisers, targeting the folks that are like um, maybe not responsible, but profiting from or enabling um, these different types um, uh, of representations. But um, it's more like people gotta know that you're changing the channel and the reason that you're changing the channel for. Yeah, I couldn't agree with that more. Yeah, I mean, as somebody from the digital world, I think social media has such an incredible ability to step into that role of accountability. So for sure, um, there's entire campaigns that have started just from one person being like, wow, this is wild, you know? Um, and so never underestimate the power of your voice. Um, is there anyone else who wants to add to that? Nope, everyone agrees with Arisha. <laughs> Do you guys have any other questions you wanna pop up here? Let's see. Janissa Azard to the panel. I know a lot of those in the media are having conversations right now, but will we see changes in content once programs come back or is everything geared towards the future? I think that, you know, people make the industry. So if you are tired of the uh, things that you've seen out and you've seen this, this movement of Black Lives Matters and all the things that have been happening, if you speak up and say, no, we don't wanna see something that is not a real representation, I think it will change. But you, the people hold that, that power to um, navigate it and kind of gear where the industry goes in a sense because you're the consumers. So um, I think we have so much more power than we even realize. Arisha and Yvette, do you guys see sort of changes in this pipeline of content that's coming along or has it screeched to a halt right now? <laughs> well, it screeched to a halt. Um, but I, you know, I agree um, that, you know, it's social media, right? We have to, um, we definitely have to be loud and we have to um, ask for these, um, for these, for the content. And, and I think that that's all we can do right now. But I, I couldn't speak to exactly what is being made Obviously, nothing is being made right now, but I'm sure in development, there's, um, you know, this, there's definitely more in development, but I don't think we'll see that for a long time, obviously, because of COVID. Okay. Arisha, do you have any insight? I mean, I, think, I mean, we've seen some stuff come off the air, like live PD. We've seen, you know, some yeah. of the cops sort of being canceled from another station. Um, yeah, but I'm in the same boat. I, I, I don't know what the future looks like yeah. generally. Um, I do believe that um, a lot of people are in deep reflection that like if there's any benefit to this moment, there is like time to figure it out. Um, and I think our job is to like hold people responsible. Like there's like no excuse. You've had like months, months now, probably, or, you know, another year um, to really figure out uh, how to improve diversity. Um, you haven't been traveling. Like there's very little excuse um, for this like next batch of content in my mind. Yeah. And places have been responding, you know, things are getting pulled off of streamers and getting a uh, warning, <laughs> trigger warnings now, which would have never happened even just six months ago. So a change does seem to be afoot. Um, next question, I think it was specifically. Um, do you have any suggestions of how to break into the industry as a Latina just starting off in acting? Hilly. <laughs> how to break into the industry? Yeah. Well, I always say, uh, know your craft first. Um, I, I'm a firm believer in uh, if you want something, study your craft first because an opportunity is only an opportunity if you're ready when it comes. Um, but then also um, having a team behind you. Uh, for many years, I was my own manager, my own agent, and um, I think having a team behind you helps a lot. So getting connected with, with a good manager, with a good agent to help get you indoors and spaces um, is the first thing that I would suggest, but knowing your craft. 
that's great advice. Do you guys have anything to add or? Absolutely not. Just uh, yeah. yeah, I was like, I, I have no so. idea. Not acting in anything, like you know, just being prepared. Yeah, and educating yourself and knowing what you're getting into. Yeah, and don't try to do it all on your own, right? Like mentorship is so important, and really connecting with that team that she was mentioning. I think they're getting a new question ready. Alana wants to know at what at what point do we stop trying to hold current gatekeepers accountable and start building our own gates? It's a great question. <laughs> I think at any point, I think at any point, um, like I said, we are the storytellers. Anybody has an opportunity to do whatever it is that you want to do. We all make this world go around. So I think at any point, we become the gatekeepers. It's about putting forth that initiative and building that momentum behind yourself to do those things. Um, so yeah, I think that that answers for itself. I mean, I think it's incredibly important. Um, I, I, you know, I don't fully believe in this, like pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Like, you know, even there's probably like a reason um, that uh, we're struggling to create our own um, gates, that there are like these systemic things in front of us um, uh, that are sort of preventing that. Um, but I do think it's incredibly important. I mean, at, what's hard about um, where media is today is that it's just so consolidated. Even though there's more oppor opportunities, um, you know, with streaming platforms and with the internet, uh, but there there is a lot of like big media consolidation that like keeps, I think, a lot of these gatekeepers in power and, and keeps them growing their power. Um, but I do think it's important for us to look at maybe some of the systemic reasons that that hasn't happened previously because we all, like I know that black people are influencers, that black people are creative influencers, that we are trendsetters in so many different ways. Um, and so there are um, a set of systemic challenges that I, I'm, I'm guessing are, has, have made it really hard um, for us to break in that way. But I do think it's important for us to continue to persist. Yvette, do you have anything to add to this question? Oh, you're muted again. <laughs> I'm so sorry about that. Um, no, I agree with I agree with both of them. Um, in terms of you know, it's 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 frustrating. It's a very frustrating. I, if you see my face, I'm frustrated with that question. Yeah. I completely understand where you're coming from, but you know, it does. Just to her point, there's very few um, places where you where where content is being made. We can make our own content, and we do have the opportunity to get things out on social media, and and that is definitely creating um, a lot of opportunities. But until we, um, I would say, if you are in, if you work in a studio or at a network or at a production company, and you are having a meeting and you are sitting at a table and you look around you, um, if your if the group that is surrounding you does not look like America, look at the percentage. If you don't have at least thirty percent of um, diversity in that room, then you have an opportunity to affect change. And I know that's not this very specific question, but I have to say that that's the only way we're really going to see a big change is that every single individual that works in this industry can actually stop, look at them, look at where they are, turn, you know, take a look, take a picture, post it on, you know, show me your team. Post it on social media, hashtag show me your team, show me what it looks like on the inside of where you are. If everybody looks like you, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. That's a good answer. Okay, and I think we have one last question before we wrap it up. Not sure if this was asked earlier or addressed, but what are the changes being addressed for Asian Americans in media? This is a good question. We, I don't, yeah, we wanted somebody. I don't think there's. I don't think that there's enough uh, change that's being made across the scale. Um, but specifically to this question, I don't think that there's enough, and that is how I would answer this question. I agree, and also um, at Native American um, community, and and um, I mean, I, I work and I'm involved in a lot of coalitions with other um, folks in this industry from all of these communities, and we are behind the scenes getting together and discussing this. And, and our groups consist of African-American, Latinos, Amer Native Americans, 
um, Asian Americans. So we are trying to build coalition and power. And one of the things that I say is when I walk in a room, I'm walking in that room and I am representing all of my brothers and sisters so that it's not like they, the whole, um, there's this Spanish, there's a Spanish saying that says, quítate tú para poner medio. You know, and basically it's like, you know, move out of the way. Let, I, there's only one, there's only space for one of us here. So move out of the way so that I can take this space. So instead of that mentality, that little piece of, uh, you know, what is it, this crumb mentality? It's like when we show up, let's show up for all, for each other. And I do believe, I really feel that energy shifting where we all truly understand that, that power is in numbers. And um, and looking to November, um, if we don't understand that more, that like we must come together and we must be unified and we must um, work, uh, represent each other and work towards unity. I don't, I don't have a ton to add to that. I, I don't think there's enough work being done on on that specific yeah. issue. And I do, but I what I will add is. Um, and I think this adds to a, a vet's point. Um, we have to be careful of getting into like fights with each other um, about this. Um, like we've seen how um, Black Panther helps a set of other movies get made um, outside of the yeah. Black community. Like all of these things build on each other, I think. Um, and so I think we have to just, because we're trying to build this coalition of women of color um, or people of color, we just have to be really careful to like fall into, which is not what you're doing at all, Jennifer, but I, I, I have seen in the past where we get into this like, um, uh, why not us? Why not? And it's like, we're, we're a unified, we're a unified us um, in this moment. Yeah. And I will say also that there are organizations dedicated for representation of every, um, you know, <laughs> Black, Indigenous, people of color um, that can be found and you should join them and you should elevate your own voice within all of those movements because we need as many people involved as possible. Um, all right, guys. Well, we are coming to the end of this discussion. Thank you so much for joining us. I feel like this was really important and it was really beautiful to hear all of your perspectives. Um, just one last plug. <laughs> um, please continue to stay up to date on everything that Rap Women is doing at rapwomen.com. And while you're there, please sign up for the weekly newsletter and you can get career advice, exclusive interviews, breaking news, and more. All right. It was wonderful seeing all of you guys. Take care.